greet you this morning in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We are so grateful to the Lord that we are not building our faith and our hopes on a construct of man, but we this morning can say that we are standing on a revelation that God has given us personally to each one. You know, that's what's so wonderful. The Lord doesn't just give us a global revelation. No, He's dealing with every heart opens our understanding, lets us see the things that we need to see. And I believe it's what He has shown us and done for us that has really brought us to this place, to a place where we can fully participate in a worship that is acceptable to the Lord. Amen. So may the Lord bless you each one this morning as we have gathered. Uh, I believe we've come because we are looking to the Lord for a blessing. And He's always faithful regardless of who stands behind the pulpit and uh, uh, he's the one that knows what we have need of and will find a way to get to us that nourishment that we need in every situation we thank the lord for each one that can be here this morning may the lord bless you now we uh, would like to just also mention this afternoon service is um, basically going to incorporate a memorial for sister beryl uh, Bereth's uh, uh, daughter that passed away during the week uh, so uh, we just felt to have a meeting with our sister some of her family has taken care of the funeral and doing their own things around that so she just felt to be able to be with believers and just do something so uh, we'll incorporate that in this afternoon service and uh, trust that you can come to support our sister we uh, truly believe that it's a rough time to go through and we express our condolences to her again this morning and then also as we mentioned in the week we think of brother Nami and Naidu that lost his brother during the week also and uh, just trusting the Lord to bring comfort and strength to these families amen we also would like to just continue to ask for prayer for brother Brian uh, gross down in Cape Town uh, really needs the Lord's touch his circumstances are not good we believe that our God is more than able so we just want to remember him as well amen can we turn in our Bibles to st. Matthew chapter 24 and uh, want to continue with our thoughts this will be part four ground zero Jerusalem and uh, just feel this morning <clears throat> to just touch on a couple of further points on this that would be of value to us as believers we have uh, looked at various things and I trust that as we are looking at these uh, types and shadows we're also seeing the real as I said in the first meeting on ground zero that I believe the Lord is speaking to our hearts that every heart must have a ground zero a place where God starts to deal with you individually changes your life that you can know back there that's where the Lord met me something changed something became new and unless we have that renewing by the Holy Spirit we are still just fumbling around but the Lord had in, in the night natural the types and the shadows he had chosen a specific spot to have Abram come as we saw last week to have David offer sacrifices and where the temple finally was built so we just believe that the Lord deals with us on the same basis and a principle and I'm so glad for uh, a ground zero as we said no matter what happened God chose that spot no matter what was erected and will be erected God still keeps his choosing and I'm so glad that God's election isn't on today and off tomorrow every time we disappoint him now he goes and picks somebody else and rejects us no he keeps to his election if he has elected us he will bring us if we rebellious he'll make us repent whatever it is but he will have his way amongst us amen if we can turn to Matthew 24 reading just a couple of verses from this uh, 
verse 1 to 3 firstly and Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple and Jesus said unto them see ye not all these things verily I say unto you there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down then so we know that was prophecy Lord himself showing the destruction of the temple which Titus helped to bring that to fulfillment when they destroyed the temple with the siege of Jerusalem in AD 70 uh, <clears throat> and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives the disciples came unto him privately saying tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world and I want us just to notice <coughs> That the scripture shows that he asks they ask three questions and he starts to answer them we're not going to go into that detail this morning but I want you to notice uh, verse 14 he says and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come that's a tremendous uh, insight the Lord leaves with us that the gospel is is going to spread out and is going to reach all nations then comes the end we're standing at that point we realize that this gospel has reached the far corners of the earth in almost every place you'll find some assembly that is this day gathered around the true word of God what a privilege that is but notice now he goes on, he says, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. And we noticed how that the Lord really showing them there's a time they'll be scattered. There's a time they'll be brought back. And when they come back in their homeland, what are they going to find? They're going to find that dome that you see with a golden dome right now as it's referred to dome of the rock Muslim structure built over the rock of sacrifice for lack of maybe a better word which is none other than Mount Moriah we showed you last week some of those things in a moment we'll get back to that so I want us just to notice that and then also if you will go to verse 26 he says wherefore if they shall say unto you, Behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he's in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Amen. And we understand from this very clearly, Brother Branham shows the gospel travels from the east, goes to the west. Amen. And he's really showing that this is uh, a quick work of God that is dealing with the Gentiles like a lightning strike coming from the east right through to the west. Amen. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And then he adds this verse. And you might sometimes wonder why is that in here? He's dealing with Israel as it were telling them when their time comes back. But then he says wheresoever the carcass is there will the eagles be gathered together he says there's a place when the lightning strikes to the west there's a place where the eagles will feed and he points that to us may the lord add the blessing to his word let's just bow and pray heavenly father we are so grateful this morning as we come to you we stand in the presence of the almighty god and we are so grateful to know that we have a hope in this life Lord some of our loved ones have seen difficult trials this week our sister Bereth and brother Nami with the loss of loved ones Lord but we are so glad that we find strength and encouragement in you you are the one that looks upon our needs and sees what we have need of Lord, this morning we have come to this place. 
There's a joy in our hearts because we know that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And because he rose, so we will rise also. Lord, and we are confident of this one thing, that we do not enter in on merits of our own, but we enter because of your election and your abundant mercy and grace towards us. May your name be glorified amongst us this morning. Speak to our hearts. You know exactly what we have need of, and we just want to commit the service to you. Speaker and hearer, Lord, we surrender to your will, and may you have the preeminence we ask in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. <coughs> now, if I can just maybe take a moment to go just very quickly through some of the things we looked at last week. That's just a depiction of what they believe Solomon's temple looked like standing on Temple Mount, particularly built over what is referred to as the Rock of Sacrifice. As we looked at it last week, we found out that God told Abraham, take your son, your only son, and go and sacrifice him. And uh, the Lord says, go to the land of Moriah and to the place that I will show you. So God picked the spot on Mount Moriah. Now, that is so wonderful when you look at that, that this uh, actual spot here is exactly the same place that we found when David uh, had numbered the people. The scripture tells us God was not pleased with his numbering of the people because he said you run to rely on the arm of flesh, the numbers. And therefore, the Lord sent a pestilence amongst them. David had a right to choose. You want to fall under the enemy for certain years or uh, different choices God put to him. The final choice was, or do you want to surrender to the hand of the Lord and let a pestilence come for three days? And he said, I rather rely on the hand of God than on the hand of men. He had switched his opinion and wisely so. And the scripture says that the angel of the Lord was coming to Jerusalem, destroying. And God saw the angel, and he saw the repentant heart, because David stood there. He saw the angel at Jerusalem, and he said, Lord, why should everybody suffer? I did wrong. Let it be on my house. And God says to the angel, stay your hand. And the angel speaks to David and says, go and sacrifice on the threshing floor of the Jebusite. Amen. And David comes and he says, I will buy this ground off you, this threshing floor. And that we saw from scripture and there's two different accounts of that, that David says, I don't want it at a cheaper rate. I will pay full price and he paid the full price for the land. So we know who owns that place. Because David bought it. Amen. When Solomon, the scripture says then, David bought that. And there he built an altar. And he sacrificed unto the Lord. Wonderfully, the scripture says that God answered by fire from heaven. And consumed the sacrifice. Same thing that he did for Elijah some years later. Amen. Now, if we just follow that through a little bit, then comes the time David wants to build a temple. The Lord says, no, your hands are too much full of blood. You've been in wars and things. Your son, Solomon, he will build the house. And the scripture says when he started building the house, he built it on the same place that his father had made the altar on the threshing floor. Now, when we look at that, you realize that God chose that spot over and over and over as a specific spot. Amen. It's part of why we've titled this little series on Ground Zero Jerusalem. Because there is a spot that God chose. Showing in the natural what God does in the spiritual. These are types and shadows. But when God has elected a piece of dust, a place of earth, 
where he wants to place his name, he is not going to change his mind. That's such an encouragement to me this morning, brother, sister, when you realize that God's election cannot be defeated. But Israel, like as many others who stand under election, did not always obey God. And they started to rebel. And finally, this temple that Solomon had built that stood really as the glory of Jerusalem got destroyed. I think the date they give that is 587 before Christ. And we find that in its place, finally, Herod's temple was built. First it was reconstructed under Ezra and Nehemiah. Then under Herod was reconstructed once more and expanded to more or less what you see on the picture now. This is the kind of structure that was there when Jesus was there. And it's so wonderful when you really think of it, that very same place that Abraham went to with Isaac, the same place that David brought a sacrifice that turned the fate of Israel, where God answered by fire, the very same place is where Jesus came and not only cleansed that temple, but taught in that temple and showed that that temple was a type of his own body. And here as we read in Matthew 24, he says that will be torn down. And in the place of it will be built the abomination that maketh desolation. As we see the Temple Mount today. Recognizing from statements that Brother Branham makes and the scriptural references that that will have to go at some point. And the world's not happy about that because they think that this is a great heritage and they want to keep everybody, the Muslims and everybody happy. They don't want to cause conflict, but we know that it must make way. Amen. Amen. Brother Bram says they will rebuild that temple. So we had those three different structures really that have been standing there through the time. Now, <clears throat> As we said last week, wonderfully placed little chapel on the opposite side on the uh, slopes of um, the Mount of Olives with the cross really blotting out this horrible structure that has to give way really for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what Israel needs. I want to say it this morning. They may establish temple worship again. But that's not where the 144,000 salvation comes from. No other lamb can shed its blood. No heifer, no nothing can take the place of what Jesus Christ has already completely fulfilled. And that's why Brother Branham shows you that when those two witnesses come on the scene to Israel, they come and they preach repentance and baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The same message they first turned down is the message that they will have to come back. It's the same sacrifice that they called for, crucify Him, crucify Him, that they will recognize this is Him. Thank God for that. Now, <clears throat> as we look at the Golden Gate there, as it's referred to, or Eastern Gate, I showed you last week that this is the gate through which you would come to enter into the Table Mount, uh, the, the Temple Mount area. And when you come into this Temple Mount area, this is literally the area from which Jesus would have come. Uh, this picture is taken as we were on the slopes of the, the Mount of Olives, looking across and the very kind of position where Jesus might have stood when he wept over Jerusalem and said, How oft would I have gathered you as a hen doth her brood, but you would not. And he, and he wept because of their rebellion and their blindness. But coming down that one day, triumphantly, as he descended the hill of uh, 
the Mount of Olives, there were worshipers throwing palm leaves before him. Scripture says even clothed articles, everything just, just showing a welcoming sign as he come down and entered through that gate into the temple area. Finally, again on that time, speaking about the need for the cleansing of the temple and the need that this should be regarded as the house of God. If you will go with me quickly to Ezekiel 44. I want to just deal very briefly with this principle that you find now this gate has been blocked up. As we showed that even the Muslims know that prophecy shows that Christ would come through that gate. And to try and make sure that Israel does not get a Messiah, they all blocked it up so that no one can come through that gate. And it's been like that for hundreds of years now. But the scripture says here in Ezekiel 44, <coughs> and if you really watch what Ezekiel is describing was not the condition in his day. He was looking forward in prophecy. In fact, if you watch the way he describes the temple, Ezekiel lived in the time when the first temple was still standing. He spoke of its destruction. But when he describes the temple and the grounds around the temple, he's describing it after it's been rebuilt and restored like it was in the day of Herod. But even more so we find that he looks forward right to the very end. And we'll come to that if time will permit us. But when he starts to speak about the gate, he's brought to the gate. Listen what the scripture says. Then he brought me back the way of the gate of the outward sanctuary which looketh toward the east, and it was shut. Amen? Long, 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 long before it ever was shut, it was seen by Ezekiel. Then said the Lord unto me, This gate shall be shut, it shall not be opened, and no man shall enter in by it, because the Lord, the God of Israel, has entered in by it, therefore it shall be shut. Amen. Amen. Now, this is so wonderful. So the Lord uh, shows in the scripture that there is another way to get to the temple. There's a porch by the gate and so forth. And he starts to speak about the fact that it will not permanently disrupt and he's finally brought to the way of the north gate, which allows you entrance into the uh, Temple Mount area. Now, <clears throat> as we look at it this morning, I want us just to focus a little bit on what is taking place. As we see there on the right hand side, you'll see the middle of the markings there it says Golden Gate. That's really coming in from the east coming into the temple area exactly the way Jesus would have come. Now <clears throat> Solomon's temple would have stood about there. Uh, I want you just to familiarize yourself a little bit. You'll see the area that's marked out on the left two-thirds of the picture. That's the old city, Jerusalem with its walls. To the right of that you have the Kidron River, Kidron Valley, and then to the right of that would be the Mount of Olives. So Jesus, even keeping true to all the principles, his approach to the temple was always coming from the east, moving in a westerly direction. Coming from the east, going west. Always, you'll notice he's coming off the Mount of Olives from Gethsemane. Somehow, he's always coming from that side, coming in to go to the west. Now, what was built there was built on the pattern that we saw in the wilderness. God instructed Moses and said, listen, you must build a tabernacle. Genesis, uh, sorry, Exodus 25 verse 8. Build me a tabernacle so that I may dwell among the people. 
Now I trust you realize that this says that God has wanting to find a place where he can personally come and dwell with his people. That's the purpose. The purpose of the temple was not to show nations around them how wealthy they can be. When Solomon built it, it was a very rich structure. They're talking today it may cost 20 to 30 billion dollars to reconstruct the temple as it was done in the days of Solomon. So much gold, so much precious materials went into that 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 is the kind of figure that they actually place upon it. But it was built after the pattern that God showed Moses in the wilderness. And the Lord says, build me a tabernacle that I may dwell amongst the people. We have a little cutout here which really lets you see the outer court. Then they go through the first veil into the holy place. In which holy place you find on the right hand side is the table of shoe bread. That would be the northern side. On the southern side is the candlesticks. Just before the second veil you find the altar of incense. Amen. Now, that also places the spot where John wa- John's father was, Zechariah, when the angel appeared to him, which once again puts another pinpoint on that same rock of sacrifice that the angel appeared there again like it did in the day of David. Amen. Now, behind the second veil, the Holy of Holies, there is the Ark of Testimony, with the mercy seat above inside it as we know there is Aaron's rod that budded uh, bowl with the, the manna that did not corrupt and also the two stones tablets that God had written for Moses to have the law the ten commandments to be placed in the ark of testimony just very quickly again the pattern We realize outer court as we have it there, the gate on the eastern side. So the approach would always be coming from the east, coming in, going westward. Amen. That would be the approach coming, bringing sacrifice to the altar. All of those things always east to west. To finally come on the day of atonement into the most holy. Where... The atonement would be made and Israel would find God's favor and blessing for another year ahead. There where we've got that little red dot at the moment is just uh, signifying uh, the coming of a sacrifice as it would have been Christ the Lamb coming and entering through that. Now, the view from there, you'd come through the gap in the front there, the gate, and then... In front of you, the first thing would be the altar of sacrifice that was there. Then we would find entering through the first veil. As we said, on the right, you've got the table of shewbread. On the left, you've got the candlesticks right in front of the veil, the altar of incense. Then if we move a little closer, I want to just bring it to this point here uh, where you see the little blue dot there. That's about the place where you would find the high priest would be standing just before entering in to the most holy place. Altar of incense on the right. The scripture says that he would take coals off the altar and he would take incense beaten small, put it upon those coals. That would be the first thing he takes in behind the veil on the day of atonement. Now, (coughs) right about that red spot right there. Behind there, The presence of God. Now I want to just say this. This was of utmost importance. The Lord said to Moses, Don't let Aaron's sons come at any time behind the veil. Only on that one particular day can the high priest come behind the veil with the correct blood. Sacrifice must have been made on the outside. Right approach. And the Lord says, I will appear on the mercy seat behind the veil. In other words, the Shekinah glory of God would come down. God did not want them to come in there into an empty space. But they come in, coming into the presence of God. Amen. And I just want to say this. This is God's journey with every believer. We come from the sacrifice, accepting Jesus Christ as our personal Savior through sanctification. That's what the uh, basin, the uh, labor 
stands for, as it was later referred to in the day of Solomon as the sea of glass. And in the book of Revelation, it speaks in that way too. And, and then you come into the holy place, which is where the anointing of the Holy Spirit comes upon you. But God doesn't want to leave you with just a flesh or a spirit anointing. He wants your soul. So he wants to do a work on the inward parts. He, and I want to say this, unless you have that, it's still death today. It's got to be the presence of Jesus Christ coming into the soul of man because that is what secures you knowing that it's the life of God. That's eternal life. There is no other eternal life but His life coming into you. If these are types and shadows... We better realize tonight, uh, this morning, brother, sister, that God has got a way of approach. He's got a way things have to be done. And we come specifically according to God's ordinances. That's what types and shadows teach us. Is that God had a particular approach to this. Now, behind the veil there, as we said, you would find the Ark of the Covenant in which you find the articles as we see there, the tablets of stone, the bowl, and also the uh, rod of Aaron that budded. Now, if we uh, just move forward to the time of Jesus, the approach would have been through the eastern gate, coming into the outer court, facing the temple that was reconstructed and somewhat modified by the Herod just before the arrival of Christ. I think they said he finished that two years before Jesus Christ was born. Isn't that very striking that it should be so that the temple is made ready and everything is in line when he, the God of the temple, actually arrives on the scene. Very, very striking. I'm sure Herod had no idea. Everybody believes that he had very much different motives and objectives, but God doesn't care what motives and objectives they have. He will move someone to fulfill his own purpose. Amen. So the approach would come then, uh, as we see there, coming from the eastern side into the uh, outer court. Finally, coming now to the first entrance, the first veil, and uh, going in on the inside in the holy place, this would be more or less what would be seen. So even when Jesus went in there at that time, this would be the elaborate building that was constructed at that time, depicting a high priest standing there, got candlestick here. We just move along. There's your altar of incense. And I just want to say, as we look at this, remember in Revelations 4, John is taken in the Spirit. The Scripture says he is caught up in the Spirit. And we really see that that's depicting him moving into the holy place. And as he's there, the Scripture says, he says, and a door was opened in heaven. And I saw one sit upon the throne. Now that means he's looking right into the throne room of God. Amen. Through the second veil. Amen. You've got to see through the second veil to be able to come and see into the throne room of God. Now John, type of the bride, seeing a revelation that's destined for our end time. He is caught up in this and a door opens in heaven. Now, I just want to reiterate, Brother Branham says, Christ is all of the furniture and the structure and everything of the temple. Amen. Amen. He is the door. He is the ark. He is the word in the ark. He is the sacrifice. He is the blood that is shed. He is the high priest. He is the temple. And here we find He is the one that is on the throne. Amen. Amen. And the scripture tells us in chapter 5 that he had a little book open. A little book that was sealed, sorry, with seven seals. A book of redemption, a title deed. Amen. Sealed. The seals hold the mysteries. 
And then we find there is nobody worthy to come and take that book and look upon it, break the seals, and because of that, John weeps. Amen? He weeps because nobody is found worthy. And he knows that he's witnessed Christ at Calvary. He's witnessed the sacrifices. It's, it's like the price is paid, but now what do you do? You can't get the title. And there's a blockage because there has to be one that is worthy to come and take that step to bring an end to the weeping. One of the elders comes to John and says, John, don't cry no more. Don't weep. The line of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. Now just to save a little bit of time, I did not include that slide this morning, but on the eastern side, where the entrance is that you would come into the temple area, where you would come through the first veil, everything on the eastern side was the side where Judah would have encamped in the wilderness. He was the line of Judah by type and shadow. Now here is John. He's already in the holy place. He's looking for somebody to take that book from the one who's seated on the throne to break the seals. And the elder says, don't cry. The line of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. Well, John knows the scripture. John knows what it's about. So what does Brother Branham say? John turned to look. Turned in the direction of where that line would be. Exactly turning back to the east. And when he does, he looks past the candlesticks, right to the opening, looking right out. Amen? And coming from the east is a lamb as it had been slain. He does not see the lion, but it is the lion. Because this time he's not coming to be slain, but he's bearing the prince that proves that he has been slain, that he has paid the price, that he was the innocent spotless sacrifice that was demanded and he the only one worthy stepped on the scene to take the book and to break the seals and the scripture tells us that when he died and paid that price the veil in the temple was rent from the top to the bottom permanently opening the access for the believer back into the presence of God back to that which was lost in Eden remember in Eden when they sinned man was driven out and at the eastern gate of Eden God placed a cherubim guarding the way back to the tree of life back to the presence of Christ amen what chaos was there for those who remained. You know, from that time on, you don't really find anything else recorded that was happening in the temple other than the disciples coming there once they were filled with the Holy Ghost and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. 70 AD, finally destroyed. Lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, back to our picture here just for a moment. So as we look at this, coming through the Golden Gate, there you have the entrance to this table. Uh, sorry, I keep saying table mountain. I suppose that's because we got a flat rock somewhere. <coughs> nothing like this. Nothing like the same choosing of God. Amen. Now, you come into this Temple Mount area. As we said, moving from the east to the west. Amen? Right through that golden gate or eastern gate. It, it's quite striking how that when we sing uh, about crossing over, we talk about coming to the eastern gate. Our entrance into the other side. We come through the eastern gate. Because why? This is all a pattern of heaven. We say 
Solomon built it on the pattern of, of what Moses did. I read you the scripture last week where the scripture says that Solomon was instructed on how to build the temple. It didn't just, mm, one day let's build it like that, let's build it like that, like this uh, dome of the rock that they put over this place. No, it was under God's direction. Now, what Moses did in the wilderness was under God's direction. Uh, the, the book of Hebrews tells us that God showed Moses to build it after the pattern that's in heaven. Amen. So you, you've got something of the heavenlies come down. Oh my, can, can we just see that for a moment? Come right down to ground zero in Jerusalem. Pattern that there so that we can be aware God's got a pattern, God's got a plan, and He does things in a very specific way. This is what Jerusalem looks like today. All the streets and whatever is there, and you'll even find there's uh, a couple of restaurants pointed out on this map. This is live Google Maps as it is now. But I wanted to mark out the spot there where you see the black dot. That's where Solomon's temple would have stood. And you know, even Google was nice to me. I said, Solomon's temple, Jerusalem, and bang, it just put it right there. Amen. So that's very striking. So when we just look at that, I uh, just want to remind you, there's a process that's taking place here, coming from the east, going westward. First Christ's work, first coming, come to the altar, come to Calvary, come for sacrifice. That's how he first comes. Amen. Then he comes into, on the Day of Atonement, the most holy place or holy of holies. The blood is taken in there. And Brother Branham says, when the Lamb comes forward to take the book, He comes in and He takes the book from the hand of Him that sat upon the throne, climbs upon the throne, and sits down. So now you have the blood from the altar moved right into the most holy place, which only happens on the Day of Atonement. And Brother Branham says, like they had days of atonement under their worship, we must have a day of atonement to this also. Now we come to a time and a season where now the Lamb comes forward, takes the book, climbs upon the throne, and sits down. What does he do then? The scripture tells us he starts to break the seals. As he breaks the seals, the mystery is unfolded. There's Things that happen. Brother Branham shows a mystery unfolds. Names are called. Amen. Revealing who you are. Amen. And then finally, what does he do? He takes the open book, puts it in the hand of an angel, which is none other than himself in angelic form. And down comes the angel in Revelations 10 with an open book and says to John, Now, this is the season. The mystery of God is finished under the sounding of the seventh angel. Now, John, go to the angel and take the book that is in the angel's hand. And when he says to the angel, give me the book, the angel says, take it and eat it up. In other words, you've got to take this revelation, this unfolding, and put it inside of you. And then he says, you will prophesy again to nations and kingdoms, amen, which really says that from here, from the opening of the seals, it will go out again across the face of the earth. Now, after the scripture, and, and I'm just running ahead of myself here a little bit, if you'll excuse me, I don't know if we'll have the time to get to it, but Ezekiel describes the approach coming through the Eastern Gate, the Day of Atonement, finally, and then once the sacrifice is accepted in the most holy place, he says, I saw a little trickle of water. Water started to run out from the throne, from the altar, uh, from the 
really from where the ark would be, from the innermost chamber. A little trickle of water come down and come run through out of the holy place, down past the south side of the altar, started to go out from there, the scripture says, into the deserts and finally into the sea. Amen? Amen. Now, I know many years ago we looked at this, but I felt this morning, and some of our young people were probably hardly thought of at that time, so we want to just go through some of this for everybody's benefit. There's the United States. The right side, I'm not sure if it's exactly 810 Penn Street, but that's as close to the corner of 8th and Penn Street that I could come where Branham Tabernacle is. Brother Branham was ministering there. That was his home church. That's where he started out. That's where he uh, really ministered so many of the messages and always said, I'll come back here when I need to make tapes and whatever needs to happen because this is really where it will go forth from. But he's there. He lives in Jeffersonville. And the Lord starts to speak to him and says to him, you need to go west. He didn't understand why. And, and if you read the message, sirs, uh, is this the time as we called it in the old days? Or what time is it, sir, as they now put the label on? It's fine, whichever way. The content is the same. The reality is in there, Brother Branham constantly is referring to uh, dreams and visions that were coming that was all pointing to this move going into the west, going, moving westward, moving westward all the time. Everything has got to it. So the angel of the Lord tells Brother Branham, you need to go west. That's right. Which he finally does. And when he does, at Sunset Mountain, seven angels come down. The Lord commissions him to go back to Jeffersonville and go and open the seven seals for God. Just quoting as close to the phrase as I can recall. So he goes west. Now notice he comes to the west part of the world, really. Nowhere else to go. If you keep going, you hit the ocean, and then you're in the east again anyway. And for many years, I listened to that quote, there's nowhere else for it to go but back east again. Always thinking that that's what it means. It just keeps that direction. But the reality is if you looked at the temple, when you come in from the east, you're going to hit a stone wall. There's nowhere to go but turn around and go back where you come from. You've got to go back east again. So the Lord tells him really, go back east again to go and preach that gospel. Amen? Now, <clears throat> here's the interesting part. Dot on the right, Solomon's temple. Amen? Where we had it depicted, I've just zoomed it out. On the left, I marked Sunset Mountain. That one there. Referred to as the mountain of the Lord. I uh, <clears throat> can maybe just take a couple of verses here. Be so kind as to just go with me quickly. Psalms 125. <clears throat> Psalms 125. And just reading verse 2, he says, As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, and Lord willing, we'll get to a point where we show you some of that a little clearer. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth even forever. I, I feel just to do what we've done in all the series we've done on Israel is watch now. There's a natural application. There's a spiritual application. There's things that are concrete places, actions, directions. But as that verse says, as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so God 
surrounds his people. The real thing he's interested is you, the new Jerusalem. Amen? God surrounds her. Amen? Now notice as we look at Zechariah just quickly. Zechariah chapter 8. Oh, I, I just love how the, the Word of God just comes so alive. There's so many scriptures that just start to stand out and just speak out to us. Listen, Zechariah chapter 8 verse 3. He says, Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion. Remember, He left them. He gave them over in blindness. But now, He says, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Hmm. In other words, I've still got my eye on the same spot. Natural, but also remember the spiritual. Amen? Amen. New Jerusalem. Scripture says everything is centered around Him. He is the light of that city, all of that. Now notice, He says, I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth. There's another name for your ground zero place now. It's the city of truth. Amen. Now notice, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Now, I just want to let that just settle for a moment in our minds. He says, now, this mountain of the Lord, where the Lord chose for Abram, for David, for the temple, where he himself visited. Now he says, it's not just the mountain of the Lord, it is the holy mountain. So God sanctifies it because of His presence. No wonder when another religion puts a structure on there that God calls it an abomination that maketh desolation. I brought something with me when we uh, did the first one on holy ground or on ground zero and I wanted to read this quote but I th never got to it and I wanted to just bring it in this morning and you can turn just quickly in your Bibles to Luke 23 Luke 23 and verse 33. Luke 23, verse 33. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified Him. Amen? That's Jerusalem. There they crucified him. Now, Brother Branham takes that, and I'm going to read you this quote just for a moment here. He says, You see, their eyes had to be blinded, or they would have recognized him. Instead of that being blinded, he, they, they were, he said, that Let Satan get on them, and they say, He's a fortune teller, Beelzebub. Let his blood be upon us. We know there's nothing to him, see? And the poor people was blinded. There, at Jerusalem. Amen? Amen? You know, if they weren't, there would be no pattern to follow. Because everything would have started and ended at ground zero. But notice now, he says, And the poor people was blinded. That's the reason the Eichmann group and all that group was slain back there. Had a right to come in. Their own father had to blind their eyes so he could take us. you always got to be thankful for that, brother, sister. Amen. And when you get that principle, you'll understand the fifth seal. And why the fifth seal is the number five, which is grace. Because Israel was blinded so we could get grace. But God doesn't leave them blinded. His grace returns back to them again. But notice now, he says, their own father, God, had to blind their eyes so he could take us. That's the most pathetic thing in the scriptures. Hmm. I 
I don't believe Brother Branham specialized in hyperboles. When he says that's the most pathetic thing in the scriptures, it is. Here's a people elected. God's watched over them, brought them, brought them, and promised the Messiah. And when he comes, they're so blind, they say, away with him. Amen? Amen. Blindness. I just want to remind you, there's another statement Brother Branham makes in the seal book. He says, when the Lamb steps forward to take the book, he says, it's the most sublime act in all the Holy Scripture. Now here you have the most pathetic thing happening at the mountain of God. At the holy mountain. Where his people reject him. Amen. There, he says, that's the most pathetic thing in the scriptures nearly. Just think of there, the Jews calling the blood of their own father. Their own God hanging there, bleeding. Look. There they crucified him. The Bible said that's the four of the greatest words. Now watch again. Brother Branham says that's the four of the greatest words. Amen. Look. There. Jerusalem. The most holy city in the world. They. The most holy people in the world. Crucified. The most brutal death. In the world. Him. The most important person in the world. Can I go through that again? I just love it. Way Brother Brown lays it down. There. The most holy place. Jerusalem. The most holy city in the world. They. The most holy people in the world. Crucified. The most brutal death in the world. Him. The most important person in the world. See. The religious people, the greatest religion in the world, the only true religion in the world, was standing there crucifying the very God that their Bible said would come. Mm. Ground zero. What a moment, what a time. Over here, on the left, marked out there, is another mountain. May I say another mountain that God picked? God could have revealed the seals to Brother Branham in Jeffersonville if he wanted to. But he said, no, go west, go west. He leads him to a specific place. Because God chooses the spot. A place called Mount Sunset which in itself says we're in the West. Because if you actually look at Scripture language, East is the way we speak, but when they talk about East, it would be rising of sun and setting of sun. East and West. Now, the coming of the Lord, His presence is first in the East. Finally, it must be in the West. As the lightning shines from the East, even unto the West, so shall his coming be. Amen. So now we find that the gospel moves in a straight line from the east to the west. Amen. From the mountain of the Lord we come now to a place of sunset mountain. Where you have the mountain of the Lord you have a sacrificial lamp. Where you have Sunset Mountain, you are moving into the realm of the mysterious. If I can just do that quickly. We superimpose that. I think if I bring it like that, you'll understand. There's the pattern we showed you. That's the pattern of the temple, uh, the tabernacle. Dimensions as God gave to Abram by scale. Place of sacrifice, the altar. We place that over Jerusalem. Then we come and we find the high priest on the day of atonement would have to move in. Right past the first veil, second veil, into the most holy place. But only when the Shekinah glory comes down.
May I put it on record this day. That the presence of God came down. The presence of God came down on Mount Sunset. The prophet was caught up in a constellation. Moved into something that was absolutely, totally supernatural. God chose the spot in the east. God chose the spot in the west. Amen. Amen. And then what does the Lord tell him? He says, well, you can't stand behind the second veil here. The reason for this unveiling is it's got to go out there. Because remember, on the Day of Atonement, when the high priest came in, he took those steps, he was moving in, he took the incense in, took the blood in. Firstly, the scripture says he took blood in that speaks of the sacrifice for himself. Then he took the blood in that speaks of the sacrifice for the people that shows that everything, God's full requirement is met. If he survives that, in other words, God accepts the entry into that place because nobody else was able to do that. He would come out from the most holy place into the holy place, finally come and stand at the point midway in our slide here, which is the entrance to the, the first uh, into the holy place, he would stand there and the glow of God's presence would be so on his face, it would shine through the laver and out to the people and they would all know that the presence of God, the blessings of God is upon them and they have peace from him for the following year. So there they crucified him. That was written from the records that we have believed to be almost a hundred years after Jesus Christ was born. What I'm trying to say is the words, there they crucified him, was Holy Ghost inspired to ascribe, to write down, that there in Jerusalem, they, the most holy people, would crucify the cruelest death in the world, him, the most important person in the world, Emmanuel, God made flesh. Can you imagine that? But what about Mount Sunset? There, he revealed our names. There, in the West, God chose the spot like he did choose it in Jerusalem. God said, here is where I will meet you. Go there. Amen. He, the only worthy one, the only one who could take the book, the only one who could break the seals. Amen. Revealed the most supernatural way to impart understanding. Amen. Not explained not taught, not lectured, but he revealed our names. Amen. Amen. What's our names? The identification of our origin and thus the identification of our destiny, showing that we always were part of God and that he has put us through this process and brings us right back where we started from. Amen. Oh, glory to God. Brother, sister, I trust you see the events coming from the east, coming to the west. Amen. Now, the Lamb breaks the seals, hands it to a mighty angel, go down, put it in the hands of a natural angel. Says to him, now you need to go back to Jerusalem, back to Jeffersonville. Right? You've got to go back where this all started from. To do what? To preach the revelation of the seven seals. Amen. Bring it out in the open. Amen. Now, here's the open book. John the bride is told, it's not just to be in the hand of the angel. Go take the book and eat it up. It's, it's the bride's book. The open book is the bride's book. 
When it was sealed, it was in the hands of the original owner. No one could look on it. No one could touch. But here John now, who once wept because nobody could even look at it, now the mystery is unveiled. And John not only can look at it, but he can go and he can take it. And he is told to eat it up. So when he has taken the book within himself, you see, I, I just want to make it very clear this morning. The, the revelation of the Word of God to the church in this hour is not so that you have some superior doctrine and you can outwit the denominationals. The reason is because God wants to feed your soul with something that would make you make a rapture so He can fulfill His plan to restore back the Eden condition that was there in the first place. Now we just read this morning in Matthew 24 that as the lightnings comes out of the east, even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And the Lord spoke in, in Luke 17:30 that there's coming the day of the revelation of the Son of Man. Coming of the Son of Man. And what will be identified as it was in the days of Sodom. We got brought back to the discernment, Abram. The Elohim visiting out the tent. The discernment of Sarah's heart. We haven't seen that sign till this generation. We've come to the time. We've come to the season. The book is there to eat it up. As the lightning strikes from the east even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And then he drops in, wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Take this back to Jeffersonville. To the tank. You know, the, the arrow there, let me just go back one year, just a minute. So two. And this thing's not playing along very nicely with me, but it, the blue line's supposed to be an arrow pointing to Jeffersonville. It also points to the table of shoe bread, which is where the bread is kept. And Brother Ryan said, I'll always come back here to record those tapes. I'm going west, but I'll always come back here when I need to record a tape. I'm always going to come back here. Amen. Just to keep the pattern. Amen. Now we come. Amen. Revelation of the seven seals preached. Amen. The, the message to the church, the open book. And then he says to John, you must prophesy again. Amen. So from this unveiling, from this revelation, from this understanding that's imparted to you by the revelation for your day, the message starts to go out again. All around the world. Amen. Because this gospel must be preached to all nations. Amen. Isn't that true? It's got to go around. It's got to reach us. Came to our country. It's gone to Europe. It's gone into Russia. You know, the Lord allowed all the, the veils and, and all the politics to change long enough to get the message behind all those barriers of man's politics and boundaries that they set. As I said earlier, as we speak today, this message has reached just right across the world. Hardly a country that you can say it hasn't penetrated in some form. And finally, it must go back to ground zero. This same message that you and I believe must come right back to ground zero. When that happens, we better be out the way. Because the scripture says when God starts to deal with them, it's a time of tribulation like has never been. Amen. That's why the, the, the Lord tells them there, you better watch when this thing starts happening. Trust that it's going to catch you in the right season because it's going to be a rough time. A time like it's never been and never will be again. Because the Lord wants to end this whole thing. Now, let us just go to Isaiah 30. <clears throat> As we do, remember John. John weeping. John's tears are dry. 
John gets the open book, restoration comes. Amen. Life is given. Isaiah 30 verse 18. And therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you. Because they were blinded for a season, right? Until they learned their lessons, yes, but also until he's done, finished with us. Therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you and therefore will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you for the Lord is a God of judgment blessed are all they that wait for him you know I, I, I read that verse and I thought there's another part there that I think is so wonderful because when you talk to Israel today they're saying we're waiting who are you waiting for? Our Messiah. They're waiting for Him. The scripture says, Blessed are they that wait for Him. Amen. Amen. You talk to people on our streets, they'll tell you, I'm not waiting for nobody. I'm getting on with my life. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. But Israel is waiting. They're waiting. They know something's coming. Blessed are they. Just a little side bit there. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep no more. Amen. Like John. Dry the tears. You weep no more. He will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer thee. And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction... Yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner any more. But thine eyes shall see thy teachers. You know what the Lord says now? I'm going to bring somebody to you. You're going to see somebody that's going to teach you. Amen. It's not going to be hidden away from you. You're going to have open eyes. You're going to see. You're going to see your teachers. The eyes are open. And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee. Don't cry no more. See the same type of what fits with us? Always that parallel in Scripture. Thou shalt hear a word behind thee saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it. When ye turn to the right hand, and when ye turn to the left, what's he telling them? You missed the way in the first place. Jesus stood there. He said, I am the way. They said, Crucify him. But now there is a voice behind them that says, This is the way. Turn this way. Turn that way. Exactly. Notice now. He says, Ye shall defile also the covering of the graven images of silver. Amen. Let's really do away with all the other gods and their places of worship that's put up. And the ornament of thy molten images of gold. Thou shalt cast them away as a menstruous cloth. Thou shalt say unto it, Get thee hence. Then shall he give the rain of thy seed, that thou shalt sow the ground with all, and bread of the increase of the earth, and it shall be fat and plenteous. In that day shall thy cattle feed in large pastures. And what's he saying? He's talking about restoration. The oxen likewise and the young asses that ear the ground shall eat clean provender, which has been winnowed with a shovel and with a fan. And there shall be upon every high mountain and upon every high hill rivers and streams of waters in the day of the great slaughter when the towers fall. I'm not trying to put my own interpretation to that. Moreover, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun. And the light of the sun shall be sevenfold. Now he's saying the time when he starts to return to them and starts to show favor to Israel. That's the time when the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun. This is very powerful. Just hold with me for a moment. Air conditioners are working today, so we're not that hot and sleepy. The light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun. What is the moon type? The church. 
What is the Son type? Christ. Amen? The time when she will have the light that he had, when the mysteries are revealed, she's enlightened, the word is broken, the, the truth has been brought out, she has the light like his light. She becomes him as he becomes her. Amen? The light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun. Well, how will the light of the sun be? The light of the sun will be sevenfold. Ephesus, Smyrna, right through Laodicea. Everyone had their little light. Everyone, what was it? It wasn't the people's light. God gave them light. God gave them light in the first age, second age. Now you watch, that's all part of the tabernacle. It's there, in, in, it's shown in the, in, the, in the candlesticks. Every one of those lights, everything. But what is it? He says it comes to a point here where it becomes one thing. And that's her light. It's like his light. And his light is sevenfold into the church. Hmm. <coughs> As the light of seven days. Amen. Amen. Morning, evening, morning, evening, seven days. Right? In the day that the Lord bindeth up the breach of his people. And healeth the stroke of their wound. I, I don't want to be misunderstood. So just let's try and say this. Slowly. God is finishing off with the Gentiles. There's an overlapping. When, when the angel of the Lord appears to Brother Branham to give him his commission, the last messenger to the last age, the final voice to the final age, at that time Israel becomes a nation. There's, God starts to deal with them. God starts to show favor. They start winning wars. They start getting back country. They start finding a place again where they can raise their flag. All of these things are happening while well, God's finishing off something here with us. Amen. Now, watch what he says. That in the day that the Lord bindeth up the breach of his people. Now, what is that breach? It's the chasm. It's something that comes between God and man. Sin causes the breach. Amen? Amen? Now if you watch, John comes, moves through the temple, right to the door, sees the one with a book in his hand. Door is open, and John weeps. What a place to weep. Standing in the holy place, looking at the very throne room of God. There's the book. But John is weeping. Why? Because he knows there's still something between me and God. Something I can't breach. And I believe Brother Branham perfectly titled his sermon. The breach between the seven church ages and the seven seals. Because there's a gap there when you come to the last church age. Before you come into that holy of holies and, and the real blessings flow and the mysteries. There's a little space there. There's a time. And nobody could breach that. Nobody was worthy. The, only the true high priest could step over that and, and take that book. And bring it out to us. And serve it to us. The day when the Lord bindeth up the breach of his people and healeth the stroke of their wound. Behold, the name of the Lord cometh from far. Amen. All the way from Jerusalem. Now here it is at the west coast. And a prophet of God stands there and says, That's our Lord up there. Amen. He identifies that presence of God at Mount Sunset back to the same one that started at ground zero in Jerusalem as a sacrifice. The name of the Lord comes from far. Listen what he says here. Cometh from far, burning with his anger. White wig on. Amen. That's right. People don't like to hear that. 
But right from Revelations 1, Christ is shown as the judge, the ancient of days, with a white wig on. Burning with his anger, and the burden thereof is heavy. His lips are full of indignation, his tongue as a devouring fire. Behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. And his breath as an overflowing stream shall reach to the midst of the neck to sift the nations with a sieve of vanity. And there shall be a bridle in the jaws of the people causing them to err. Ye shall have a song as in the night when a holy solemnity is kept. And gladness of heart. Hmm? Not weeping. He says, I'm going to stop that. You shall weep no more. You're going to have a song. As in the night when a holy solemnity is kept. And gladness of heart. As when one goeth with a pipe to come into the mountain of the Lord. To the mighty one of Israel. And the Lord shall cause his glorious voice to be heard. Oh, hallelujah. Isn't this the hour in which we live? Amen. Prophet of God says Christ does all three things descending. Shout, voice, trump. Yes. Shout calling the living bride together. The voice, the power that brings the resurrection, brings change of bodies. Amen. Amen. That's our season here. And then finally trump taking us to meet the Lord in the air. Amen. We're in the process of that if uh, Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4, right now, he says, what a glorious voice. Listen, he says, his glorious voice to be heard and shall show the lighting down of his arm with the indignation of his anger and with the flame of a devouring fire with scattering and tempest and hailstones. For through the voice of the Lord shall the Assyrian be beaten down. Doesn't the prophet say, the seventh seal ends all of man's systems. All of that. What? By taking up arms, planting bombs in restaurants, suicide bombing, hitting buildings with planes. No. Speak the word. It's the word. The word that you have received. That's why Satan hates what this bride preaches. He will criticize it on every opportunity. Wherever he can try to bring some doubt to it, whatever he can do, he'll do it because why? He knows that voice has got a power and it's a power of destruction of the enemy. And that voice is in the bride of Jesus Christ this morning, brother, sister. His voice is in you. His voice is here so that you can speak the words that He has revealed to us through the opening of the seals that you know who you are. You know where you come from. You know your destiny. That's why you're different. You live different. The voice has shown you the transition from death unto life. Through the voice of the Lord shall the Assyrian be beaten down. Go to Isaiah chapter 2. I'll start winding down here in a moment. But I just want you to notice something very beautiful here. And this is almost duplicated in, in a different place in the Scripture. But when you see the two, you'll see exactly why I want to read them both. The Scripture says, Isaiah chapter 2 verse 1. The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. He's now looking by vision. Way up, Right? It shall come to pass in the last days. Isaiah is not looking at the time of captivity. He is not looking at the time of the return from captivity. The scripture says he's looking by vision to the last days. Are we in the last days? All right. So Isaiah saw your day. Amen. Whew. 
No wonder Paul says to the Hebrews, God having provided something better for us. We, we got it all here. He's been watching us. He's been prophesying about it. He's been pointing everything to this last day. That's why the whole Bible has become so new to us. You can read anywhere. You can read the Kings. You can read Chronicles. You can read Exodus. You can read Genesis. Everything is speaking the message, the message, the message, the message, the message. It's just everywhere. Now, in the last days, it shall come to pass in the last days, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. You can, if you're a Bible reader, you hear Revelations 21, 22, sort of through the lines. And that's why I want you to see there's a, we showed last week, Sunday night, if you missed that, we really showed that there's a natural thing, there's a spiritual thing where the scripture speaks and I just do that for those who maybe were not here where the scripture speaks about the abomination that maketh desolation a prophet of God shows us in one place directly it points to that structure that the Muslims built over the rock of sacrifice another place he says that's nothing but the Roman Catholic system amen which you take back to Revelation that says that her cup is filled with all the abominations. Right? Now, here is Jerusalem coming back. They're doing their part. Getting things. Want to build a temple. Get everything back like it was when they rejected the Messiah. But God's been busy with a, a church. The new Jerusalem. Amen? That is the perfect fulfillment of this. He says, <coughs> All nations shall flow into it, unto it, and many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and He will teach us of His ways. Isn't that wonderful? Amen? God selected a spot. Now here is the call. We're going up there. Why are we going up? Because we want to be taught by the Word. We want to know what He wants us to know. He will teach us of His ways. And we shall walk in His paths. Oh, we're not just forgetful hearers. Nice sermon. We enjoyed that, brother. God bless you. And when we go home, we've forgotten and we don't live it. No. James says we must remember what we saw. You must remember who you are. Amen. You must remember that you're different to the world. One of the things that's so striking about Israel is those people have seen themselves as a, a group that's just different. They are who they are. And, and they know that there is another portion that's theirs that's not there for the rest of the world. The believer knows the same thing today, brother, sister. And you know that you cannot live like the world. You cannot go with their things. Why? Because of who you are. We shall walk in His ways, in His paths. For out of Zion, that types the bride, shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now the scripture here draws us a, a slight distinction. As I said in the beginning of the series, Mount Zion really, it kind of flows into Mount Moriah. It's, it's part of the same kind of structure in a way. But Mount Zion just outside the city, which really shows you that it's not dealing with the elect as a natural people, but those outside. Now the scripture says, out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. In other words, the time comes in their restoration in the last days. You're going to get it because he has already given it to the bride. Mount Zion, type of the bride. She's already got the word that they're needing. Don't stumble if I say it like this. Our word, our message is their Messiah. 
This message is Jesus Christ in word form. Amen. He was made flesh 2,000 years ago. They rejected him. Now he's in word form becoming flesh in your flesh. And from here, that same one goes back to them. And they get it by the message we have preached. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And you shall receive him in you. And the word shall go forth from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations. And shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares. And their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Whew. The millennium's on our hands. Amen? That's really what he's saying. When he starts to return to what next thing you're. Great big battles before, as God pours out his judgment on the nations, and then there's no more war. There's no more battle. No more nation rise against nation. If you will turn with me to Micah chapter 4. Micah chapter 4. Now he is virtually using the same words in the start of this part. But then he really emphasizes the millennial reign even more so. And I trust you see that that's what we're trying to show you. That when the seals are open, the word starts spreading out. It's the beginning of the water flowing from the throne of God. Ezekiel describes it. It gets richer. It, it gets a thicker stream. It doesn't stop. You know, you take a bucket of water, you pour it out. When you pour it out, it's a big bunch of water. But it may find a little stream that will go further and further. And eventually the earth sucks it up and there's no more. But the stream that starts in the most holy place is a little stream when it begins. But the further it goes, the deeper and the more mighty it is. And it becomes a tremendous throng. That is because it's showing the power of the word that's released. The life that's released in the word from the throne of God. That's the power of the opening of the seals. That's the power of the revelation of the mysteries. It's a power that brings a millennial reign. Now let's read here in Micah 4 verse 1. But in the last days, confirmed just like with Isaiah, seeing our day. In the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains. And it shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow into it. And many nations shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. It's identical to Isaiah's uh, burden, right? And he shall judge among the people, and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree. And none shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. It's spoken word. Spoken word brings millennial conditions. The word that was released upon the bride. That book, take it, eat it up. It produces a millennium. It produces a new body. I want to say this, this morning, brother, sister. If it's the last thing I ever say to you, eat the book. Eat the revelation of the word of God. Get into those things that have been stored up for us. It will transform you from this dismal condition of mortality into the glorious liberties of serving God, immortal, worshiping the only one who has a right to reign over us. I said the other day, you owe nothing to the flesh. You owe nothing to the world. You owe everything to Him who gave Himself for you and bought you with His own blood that you can surrender yourself to Him. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. 
For all people will walk, everyone in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, saith the Lord, I will assemble her that halteth, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted, and I will make her that halteth a remnant. Isn't that exactly what the scripture tells us? Amen. There's still a remnant there. And her that was cast far off a strong nation. And the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth even forever. You know when I read that I know that that had not been taken place any other time. He says he will rule them. Amen. Can I say that? He reigns over them in Mount Zion from henceforth even forever. Amen? With his bride, king and queen. Amen? There you see the kingdom of God beautifully manifested. Amen? And thou, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come, even the first dominion, who gets the power first? The bride. That's right. Because you're wedded to him. You're part of him. Like Esther was given half the kingdom. Amen. Co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Unto you, Zion, it's given first. The first dominion is given. The kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. Amen. Finally, what are they? They are the chosen people. They will have a kingdom. The scripture speaks about them permanently as being a nation. Amen? But not like they were before. Oh, and here's Revelation 5. Just to cap it all, bring it together. Watch here. Micah 4 verse 9. Now why dost thou cry out aloud? Is there no king in thee? Why are you crying? Isn't there a king? Behold the line of the tribe of Judah. That's where the Lord said, I will always have a king in that lineage. John, why are you crying? Is there not a king? Where's the king supposed to be? The line of the tribe of Judah. Oh yes, but the last time you saw him, he had a crown of thorns. And they had an inscription above him, his head. King of the Jews. Amen. But here he comes now with authority and power to reign forever and ever. Why dost thou cry out aloud? Is there no king in there? Is thy counselor perished? For pangs have taken thee as a woman in travail. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now shalt thou go forth out of the city, and thou shalt dwell in the field, and thou shalt go even to Babylon. There shall thou be delivered. There the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. And you watch, there's the parallel that he's showing now. Nation there depicting something. But here's the real thing. The Lord reigning forever and ever. Oh, it's time that we arise. It's time that we fulfill what we're supposed to do. Amen. Eat the book. He says this is what it's about. Amen. From the east to the west is gone. It's turned around. This message has gone to every nation. Oh, it's so stirring. You know, every once in a while, Brother Oswald sends me a couple of uh, clips, sometimes video clips, sometimes uh, some photographs. And they're up in, in the castaway places, if you like, in, in Malawi, in, in the hills where they can't even get with cars. Here they are, preaching the gospel. People are being baptized. People are surrendering their lives. Amen. One of the recent clips he sent me, there they were burning the tools of trade of the chief that had come to the Lord and all his methods of enchantments and all these little things. They brought it all and, and they made a big fire and they cast those things into the fire. This message has gone to those places. Where must it still reach? Here and there you find a spot where it hasn't come. But this has happened according to Matthew 24. It's gone there, brother, sister. We're right there ready. Amen. 
I said to you when we just came back from Jerusalem that the pastor of the little message church in Tel Aviv said to us that he was pastoring mainly foreigners living and working in Israel. But recently, he has been faced with more and more interest, and they have already baptized some local, shall we say, Israeli Israelis, Jews, Jews, because they started inquiring. They saw the different life. They saw something in Mount Zion, and they started to show interest. Very, very soon, this chapter will close. The Gentile bride will be gone. Amen. It's going right back to ground zero. Where it all started, very, very soon it will strike back there. But this time, they will see their teachers. They will see the Word. They will recognize Him. They will say, where did you get these wounds? Doesn't the Scripture say that? And He will tell them, in the house of my friends. Really, you gave them to me. But you're forgiven. Because on that day when he went to the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. But they were fulfilling the pattern of God. So that we can see it in plain view in our generation. Amen. Let us stand to our feet. I believe there's a sister who would like to be baptized. Isn't that wonderful? Quite a couple of weeks now. We've just seen one and after the other coming, being baptized. It's so wonderful to see that and uh, sister Audrey, ashley uh, wants to be baptized this morning we want to ask that she comes forward i say again if there's anybody else if you've repented of your sin you accept jesus christ to be the only sacrifice the only way for salvation you come identify with his name baptism in the name of jesus christ you shall receive the gift of the holy ghost the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Amen. Come and let us go unto the mountain of the Lord.